Well, hi everybody, and welcome to another encouragement from the Psalms. And today we're in Psalm 95. Psalm 95. My Bible doesn't actually have uh, written here who wrote it, um, but maybe we'll get a few clues on that a little bit later in the Psalm. But it begins, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. And at the time of recording, we're not actually allowed to gather together and sing. So this is kind of something that we long for. Sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. And there's two things so clear in that first verse. Is that worship, um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to do it communally but that the aim of it is to the Lord and to the rock of our salvation. It's, it's sung to him. Uh, and I, I thought it was really challenging what Spurgeon wrote. He said, it is to be feared that very much even of religious singing is not unto the Lord, but unto the ear of the congregation. Above all things, we must in our service of song take care that all we offer is with the heart's sincerest and most fervent intent directed towards the Lord himself. So worship is to the Lord. You know, it's it's good to have, um, you know, uh, seeker-friendly services and think, you know, what what's going to engage people and all that sort of stuff. But ultimately, our key audience is the audience of one, the audience of the Lord, the rock of our salvation. Then it says in verse 2, let us, again, an in, uh, encouragement, an invitation from the psalmist to the community to come before him. Again, we're coming before him. We're coming into his presence. And how do we come into his presence? Well, we know already we enter his gates with thanksgiving. And it's the same here again. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Extol him with music and song. So we come before him. We sing to him. And why do we do this? For the Lord is the great God, the King, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Now, it's really important here, isn't it? You know, it talks about uh, the Lord is the great God. He's the great King above all gods and in his hand are the depths of the earth. So in other words, you know, back in this time, there were territorial gods. You know, there was a god of, uh, you know, this nation, the god of that nation, the god this side of the river and the god that side of the river. But no, the big G God, the real God, the only God, the great God is king over all of those small G gods. And actually, he in his hand are the depths of the earth. So he's in charge of the whole earth. This is why we must worship him. And listen to this. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So why is the sea his? Because he made it. So who are we belonging to as we worship him? Why? Because he made us. If he makes it, it's his. Okay? If he makes it, it's his. Come. Again, the invitation comes again. Listen to this. Let us bow down. Okay, so bow down. In worship, the word here means prostrate. Okay, so laying out, you know, on the floor. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Um, so, like, it's, it's like, how low can you go here? I mean, we should be in awestruck praise, in face down worship, in, in knelt down, bowed down worship to him. Why? Because he made us. Remember, why is the sea his? Because he made it. Why should we bow down and worship? Because he made us. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care, or in most of the translations, the sheep of his hand. The sheep of his hand. You know, if you think about it, um, like, why is the sea belong to God? Because... He made it. Why are we belong to God? Because he made us. But actually, the sea never needed to be redeemed. Well, on a level it does. You know, the whole of creation will be redeemed. But Jesus didn't come to die for the sea. No, so God actually has double claim to our worship. Because not only did he make us, but he redeemed us. Okay? He paid for us twice, in a sense. 
he owns us double time you know he he made us and he redeemed us it's all here we're the the flock under his care and i love this you know if you trace through this passage now i happen to be using the niv today which is the new international version most of the time i use the esv for all the other psalms i think probably the english standard version but in the english standard version there's there's three references to the hands of god in these verses now if we if we look back on it verse four in his hand are the depths of the earth you know in his hand are the depths of the earth he owns the whole world uh, verse five the sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land he's the creator and then it says we are the the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand so we have here the possessor's hands we have the creator's hands we have the shepherd's hands and because we are in his hands we have to worship him because there's no hands i'd rather be in there's a song that says no place i'd rather be than here in your love there's no hands I'd rather be in. There's no presence I would rather be in. And when we enter his presence, we do so with thanksgiving. But then there's a, a cautionary tale here. Because it says these famous words, Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at the rebellion or, or at Meribah, as you did that day at Manasseh in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me, they tried me, though they had seen what I did. Okay, so what are we saying here? That there was a time, a cautionary tale, that we must be like really aware of when God did mighty things to people. He not only created them, but he also redeemed them out of the land of Egypt. And they didn't worship him. They didn't do any of the things that are here. Um, any of these, these encouragements to sing, to shout, to kneel, to bow down, to prostrate, to, um, you know, kneel before the Lord our maker. They didn't do those things. And it actually says, even though they had seen what he did, you know, they'd seen the opening of the Red Sea, they'd seen it all, the plagues, the redemption, the rising up of Moses, they'd seen it all, they'd seen the, the you know, the pillar of smoke and cloud, they saw the pillar of fire, they saw the whole lot but they didn't give him worship. They hardened their hearts. They hardened their hearts. And what the psalmist is saying is, today, okay, this is urgent. The worship has to be urgent. If you hear his voice, you know, if you hear his voice, worship him. Worship him. You know, it's important, isn't it, that if we don't know who, the, who wrote this psalm, okay, maybe some others uh, commentators think they do, but it actually says in Hebrews 3, for, verse 7, it says, Hebrews 3, 7, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit said, today, if you will hear my voice. You know, the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit's written the whole Bible, but the Holy Spirit saying it to the church, worship me today. Worship the Father today. Worship King Jesus today. Don't harden your hearts even though you know all the things he's done. Don't do it. Because there's, there's consequences to our, our, our heartless hymns and our non-worship. The consequences are, it says here, the anger of God, the, the hearts going astray, people not knowing his ways, and they shall never enter my rest. I love again what Spurgeon says. He said, um, with this concept of never entering the promised land, here's what he says. He says, if manna and miracles wouldn't satisfy them, why would milk and honey? If manna and miracles in the wilderness wouldn't satisfy them, why would the milk and honey of the promised land? And you know, it's a big question. If you don't want to worship God on earth, why on earth would you want to be with him for all eternity? If you want to worship King Jesus, even though you've seen what he's done for you, why on earth do you want to go to heaven and sing his praise forevermore? If you do want to worship him, can I encourage you, do as the psalm invites. We can't do it communally right now, I don't think, although maybe you're listening to this uh, at a stage in, in time when we can. 
But here's the encouragement. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For he's a great God. He's the great king above all gods. He's made us. He's redeemed us. Let's bow down. Let's get down prostrate. Let's kneel before him because he is our God and he is worthy of our worship. I encourage you to worship him today. In Jesus' name, amen.